All right, welcome to our continued study of the book of Revelation. Today, we are up to Revelation chapter 19. And this is a, it's a deep chapter. It, it contains some of the uh, deepest portions of scripture in the Bible. But we're going to do our best to, uh, to just go through them, study them. So I'm going to ask you to grab your Bible and, and a pen and paper. You know, it wouldn't be bad to pause this video and pray for God's help. Um, and let's, let's get started. Before I get into it, there's a quote by a man by the name of St. Jerome. Uh, this guy lived in the, I believe, the 300 AD time frame, 300 to 400 AD. He was responsible for translating much of the Bible into Latin. And so he was a man who knew the scriptures very well. He, the, he, he said this. He said, the scriptures are shallow enough for a babe to come and drink without fear of drowning and deep enough for theologians to swim in without ever touching the bottom. And I think that's a really neat quote. He's saying that the scriptures, if you have never read the Bible before, you can pick up the Bible and just begin reading. And you know what? God will speak to you in that. And also, you can study the Bible for 30, 40, 50 years and still never reach the, the depth Never reach the bottom. Never be able to say, oh, I got it all. I know it all. And so it's just kind of a neat quote. So let's go ahead and wade in. Let's get started. We're going to start in Revelation chapter 19 and, uh, and verse 1. I'm going to be reading this out of the New King James uh, Version. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. So I'm just going to stop right there and go through these first two verses in Revelation 19. It says, after these things, so these things would be uh, what we talked about in the last two chapters. Uh, we talked about Babylon, and uh, so and we talked about the fall of Babylon, and we talked about what is Babylon, and Babylon is the world's systems. It's religious systems, financial system, and that Babylon is going to fall. And so Revelation 19 says, after these things, John hears this loud voice. And what is this voice saying? The first thing that this voice says is, Alleluia. And uh, it's this voice of a, of a great multitude that says this. And so this great multitude, we were, it was referenced in Revelation chapter 7. And this great multitude, I believe, are people that have either been raptured from the earth or martyred during uh, the tribulation. But they are people who have some understanding and knowledge of the current time frame. So I, I say that uh, because I don't believe it's, it's, it's the redeemed. I don't believe it's the people from the past. I believe it's, it's, it has a, the, this great multitude, I believe, have a current understanding. They have a taste of Babylon. Maybe they've been, uh, maybe they've been impacted by Babylon. So they can speak firsthand about Babylon. And, uh, and they say that God has judged this great harlot. They, they, that they've, God has judged it. So they, they, can, they can say it. Um, you, can only, you can only praise God to the level that you know him. Okay, you, if, you, if you have been healed by God, you can praise God as a healer. Now, if you don't understand 
what it means to be healed by God, um, the words don't carry the same depth and impact. If you have ever been in a position where you didn't know kind of where your next paycheck was going to come from, or I should say you didn't know how you're going to pay the bills, and God miraculously provided for you. You know God and you can praise him as a provider. You can rightfully praise him. Now, if you've never experienced that, then you just say, oh yeah, God is my provider. But if you've been there and I, we've been in a position where, where we were really close and literally that same day where we found out we just didn't, our accounting just wasn't, we just thought that we had more money than we did and uh, go to the bank and, and wow, we were in a, in a tough spot. And later on that day, God used someone in the church to bless us financially. And I know it was God. I mean, we literally um, went to the bank and, and my wife says, oh, wow. Um, okay, I must have I must have not accounted for this and, and we're down to just a couple hundred bucks and we have our mortgage coming up and and we were like oh man this isn't good what are we gonna do and we prayed and hours later someone came up and handed us a check i can praise god as my provider and we could go on and on um, but I, what, i'm just saying that because this great multitude in Revelation chapter 19 are praising God who has judged the harlot. So I believe that they have a firsthand knowledge and understanding of who this harlot is. And what do they say? They say, Alleluia. And I'm going to take a little bit of time and I want to talk about this word because this word is amazing. Um, and, and plus, we're going to see a lot of this word in this chapter. So I want to take an opportunity to talk about it. Alleluia. As you read it in uh, the New Testament, and as you read in Revelation uh, 19, is A L L E L U I A. That word, Alleluia, is taken from the Hebrew word, Hallelujah. So we are familiar with those words, right? We, we, if you're a, if you're Christian, you go to church. Uh, there are many songs uh, that contain the word Alleluia or Hallelujah. Uh, so it's it's a, it's an important word, but do you know what it means, right? Is, is it something you just say because it sounds good? So let's talk about what hallelujah means. Again, hallelujah and hallelujah, same thing. Hallelujah is is a Hebrew word. Uh, it's interesting. The the writers of the Bible, I'm sorry, the translators of the Bible, did not see fit to translate this this word into English. They left it in its Hebrew form. They left it as hallelujah. So, hallelujah, let's break it up. H-A-L-L-E-L -E -E in Hebrew means to praise or to lift up, to magnify. And then uh, the last three letters of hallelujah, J-A-H, is a shortened form of uh, Yahweh. Or Lord, so it's it's Yah, uh, J A H, and we even see this in the Book of Psalms. So we have Hallel, which means to praise, at the uh, at the beginning, and then we have Yah, which means God or Lord, at the end. So really, we have praise the Lord, but I, I want to spend a little more time because in the middle of this word, we have a single letter. And that, in the, we see it as you. And that you is, uh, in the Hebrew, it's a vowel. And when that vowel is added to the verb halel, uh, it becomes something more. It, it actually, that, that you, that verb, I'm sorry, that vowel added to the, to the verb halel, makes it a command and not only that that you is a plural so it's meant to be said to more than one person it's meant to be said to two or more people so it's kind of it it, it, it really emphasizes it and takes it in and uh you know it, it takes 
it, it takes halal praise, but then it adds something more to it. It it makes it a command, not just like, all right, we should praise. It's like, no, you 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 gotta praise. Like you need to praise. And then how it's plural, it's meant to be said to more than one person. So like in Wisconsin, we'd say, you guys need to praise God. In the South, they'd say, y'all need to praise the Lord. So hallelujah. We need to praise the Lord. We need to praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. But it's just, there's just something more we need. We need to praise God. Hallelujah is a powerful word. I mean, it, again, it's so, it's so important. It's so sacred. They did not even translate it into the English. They just, you know what? We're just going to leave this in its Hebrew form. Hallelujah. You know, often when, uh, when we are praying for someone to receive the Holy Ghost and, um, you know, we begin just, just praying with them. Often, what, what, what we'll say, if, if, they're, if they haven't received it yet, we'll say, and they don't really know what to say. And, and we know that when, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, there's going to be evidence. And that evidence is you're going to speak in a different language. You're going to speak with tongues. As, as, as the Holy Ghost gives you the utterance. And so you don't just receive the Holy Ghost by just sitting there, right? You need to pray because what's going to happen is, is as you pray, then God will begin to, God will begin to take that speech and take that prayer and you will begin speaking in a different language. And so often when we are praying with somebody to receive the Holy Ghost, and they're they're just they're not saying anything off. We'll say, you know what? Just begin saying hallelujah. Just just begin. Now, again, we, we, we have to say it with meaning. We have to say it. It's not just we're not just trying to be repetitive. We know that the Bible says that, that God doesn't like repetitive prayer or you know, meaningless prayer. So we gotta have meaning behind it. But it is a, it, it's something just to begin saying, praise God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you just begin praising God like that. And often, just when they begin to praise and worship God, God will take that, that hallelujah and begin to change it into the gift of tongues. And so if you are seeking the Holy Ghost and, and you are praying often, that's a wonderful way just to, just to begin saying hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so that is what they're saying, this great multitude are saying in Revelation chapter 19. And let's move on to Revelation chapter 19 and verse three. Again, they said, hallelujah, her smoke. They're saying, let us praise the Lord. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. All right, so in verse three and four, Again, I talked about this great multitude and why do I believe it's not just, you know, the, the redeemed throughout the ages? Why? Because in verse four, it says, and the 24 elders, which we talked about many lessons back, I believe, um, I believe is a representation of Old Testament, New Testament redeemed. Those people that have been saved uh, really since the beginning of time. And I believe that the 24 elders, that's their representation of all, all the ones that have been saved throughout, throughout time up until where we're at right now, up until this tribulation period and the rapture period. I believe that's uh, represented by the 24 elders. And then we have the four living creatures, which, uh, again, we talked about, I believe represents the, the angels, the heavenly host. And so you have uh, those that have been raptured. You have those that have been redeemed throughout the ages. You have the angels. And they're all saying, hallelujah. They're all saying, let us praise the Lord. Then a voice came from heaven in verse 5 of Revelation 19 saying, praise our God. Very similar to hallelujah. All you his saints and those who fear him, both small and great. Um, so you just really have now this, this wonderful choir made up of, of all these uh, people and angels just singing this wonderful song. In Revelation 19 and verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, 
as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings. And what do you think they're saying? Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent. Omnipotent means all, omni is all, potent is, is power. So all powerful for the Lord God, all powerful reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is a righteous acts of the saints. Um, you know, I've heard and talking about this great multitude and the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thunderings. Man, I, I think it's going to be awesome. I think it's going to be just powerful. And uh, I, I've heard people tell me, you know what? I think Pentecostal praise is too exuberant. You don't, you don't need to do all that. You don't need to lift up your hands and you don't need to shout and you don't need to dance. And, and you know what my response is? You're right. We don't. And, and you don't. You don't need to praise God like that. You, you can praise God in a solemn way. You can praise God with your eyes closed, your head bowed, your hands folded. You can praise God mightily like that. But if you've ever watched a Packer game or if you've ever been to Lambeau Field and you see 70,000 people, uh, what are they doing? <laughs> they're clapping their hands. They're yelling. They're jumping up and down. Why? Because they, they, they are, they're, they're praising some players. They're praising a team. That's what they're doing. They are, um, that's what they're doing. They're, they're praising them. And so if they can do that, and we can do that, hey, I get excited at, at, at sporting events. I, I get excited. If I'm going to get excited at a Packer game, I'm going to get excited about a, a Brewer game or, or, or a kid's sporting event. How much more should we get excited about Jesus Christ? Like if, if we're going to give that much praise to, you know, some 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 guys throwing a football around shouldn't we give more praise to god so again do you have to no you don't but it certainly isn't wrong to and i believe it's right to praise god that way i believe jesus is worthy of our absolute best well however whatever your greatest praise is i believe jesus is worthy of that there's an interesting quote by charles spurgeon now again charles spurgeon was not a was not a pentecostal uh, he was a man who, you know, I, I don't know exactly how how long ago it was, a couple hundred years ago. He he was a he was a preacher and a pastor, and he said this. I just found this quote very interesting. He said, "We ought not to worship God in a half-hearted sort of way, as if it were now our, our duty to bless God, but we felt it to be a weary business, and we would get it." through as quickly as we could and have done with it. And the sooner the better. He says, no, no, all that is within me, bless his holy name. Come, my heart, wake up and summon all the powers which wait upon thee. He says, mechanical worship is easy, but worthless. He says, come, rouse yourself, my brother, Rouse thyself, O oh my own soul. And I think that's just a, a powerful, a powerful quote from a, from a preacher that says, you know what? Um, we, mechanical worship is easy. It's easy to stand up, sit down, sing a song, you know, that's mechanical. It, it's easy, but it's worthless. God is looking for heartfelt worship. And it doesn't need to be like everybody else. Okay. It doesn't, you don't need to, there isn't, you don't have to do it like everyone else, but it has to be from the heart and it has to have some, oh, it has to have some, some fervency. It has to have just some heart behind it. That's what God is looking for. All right. I better get moving on. 
Uh, we, it says the voice of a great multitude, the sound of many waters, and the sound of mighty thunderings, um, saying, let us, re let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. So we meet, we, we get to this, this pinnacle of praise, and, and rightfully so. Why? Because finally, after all, of e after all of eternity, after Adam and Eve sinned, after the entire love story that is written in the scriptures, after Jesus came to this earth and suffered and died for us, and, and now here we are in the 2,000 years of the church age, and, and now finally... Jesus Christ and his church are going to be united in a heavenly marriage. And that's why there's so much praise. This, this thing, this, this entire history of mankind has been building up to this point. This, this, this word of God is really a love story. These are love letters from Jesus to us. And now this, this love story that is that has spanned Eternity, it has spanned the, 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 the whole time frame of mankind is now coming to, the, uh, to a climactic uh, end, you know, from the fall of man, Adam and Eve, Israelites in the wilderness, Jewish people in the promised land, and all the times that we have fallen, we have now come to the marriage supper where we are going to be united to, with Jesus. As a church, we're going to be united and the Bible says that those that make it to heaven will be clothed in fine linen. It says, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And now we, we, we got to understand something here that, okay, we are not saved by our acts. Okay, we are, we are, not, we are not saved by anything that we can do. There is nothing that we can do that, that can be saved. Jesus Christ has done all the work for us to be saved. However, many use this as an excuse to continue in a sinful lifestyle after God has saved them. So God saves us because of his work on the cross. He suffered. He was beaten. He, he, he sweat drops of blood in the garden praying and he got whipped and he got a crown of thorns and he got nailed to a cross all for you and me so that we could so that we could make it to this marriage supper of the lamb and so we we believe and we have faith and we're saved and then after god saves us we say well acts are nothing i mean i you know i'm not saved by acts so why why should I even try to change? Maybe I feel like I should change some, but you know what? I'm already saved. Paul said to the Galatians in Galatians 4.19, until Christ be formed in you. You and I are supposed to, we're supposed to, we're supposed to follow the example of Jesus Christ. And that means that it's this continual process. It takes works. It takes action to, to have Christ formed in us. Now, do we do it on our own? No, the Holy Ghost helps us and the Holy Ghost guides us and the Holy Ghost gives us power to overcome sin. But the Bible says that the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Tells me that on this earth, we are to we're, we're supposed to be righteous. We're supposed to try to live a righteous life, a holy life. Revelation 19 and verse 9. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. In verse 10, and I fell at his feet to worship him. John falls at this angel's feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
So all of this builds, all of this builds to such a level that John, after 18 chapters, after seeing visions and angels and all of these things, you would think maybe he's kind of getting used to it. You would think maybe he's kind of like, okay, you know, I, I, I'm, 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 I've been seeing these different visions, and I, and he would, you think that he would kind of have a have a grip, <laughs> but what does he do? This is such an amazing praise and chorus that he actually can't help himself when he falls down at the feet of this angel that is a messenger and begins to worship him. It's kind of like John, what are you doing? He worships God, hallelujah. This angel says, uh-uh-uh, don't do that. Look, angels know the, the, the devil, Satan, was cast out of heaven because he wanted to be like God. He wanted to be equal with God. And so good, good angels know, uh-uh, you don't praise me. I don't want that. All you praise God. And so the angel says, look, I'm just a, I'm just a fellow servant. And that's really what angels are. Angels are servants just like just like we're servants, of course, they're more powerful and I'm not going to get into that, but, but they're, they're servants. They're servants just like we are. And then he says this, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's an interesting verse to me. I really had to do some, some kind of digging and, and, and looking at that because there's, it's just, it's kind of this, uh, it's like kind of what would you call it, like a nugget that this angel says like, whoa, wow, that's, 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 that, there's a lot there in just that one thing. He says the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. Now we have to understand prophecy is more than just foretelling future events. Some people just say, oh, a prophet is just someone who can see in the future. Yes, that is part of prophecy. But uh, David Bernard defines prophecy as the gift of a supernatural utterance directly from God in the language of the speaker and hears. So I'll say that again. It's the gift of a supernatural utterance directly from God in, in the language that you and I can understand. Uh, Strong's Concordance defines prophecy as to speak un, under inspiration. And now this can include preaching, uh, praising, teaching, even in private conversation. The spirit of prophecy can come upon any believer filled with the Holy Ghost. And the spirit of prophecy can come on and they can speak in, they can speak an utterance, a word directly from God. It can, it, it can happen. It has happened. And, uh, and so that's prophecy. Now, Paul, Paul tells us that all spiritual gifts need to be exercised in love. And this angel tells John that the spirit of this gift, the spirit of the gift of prophecy, is the testimony of Jesus. So the spirit of prophecy is not about self. Like, it cannot be about me. It can't be about you. If God uses you in a gift of prophecy to speak in utterance, whether it's in a Bible study, whether it's in a preaching, it cannot be about us. It has to be about the testimony of Jesus. It has to be about Jesus. And that reminds us all the way to the very first verse of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. In this next portion of scripture, we find Jesus arriving on a white horse. And um, just like the true groom coming to rescue his bride. And, uh, and so we're, we're actually going to stop there. Um, it, you know how I said that uh, this was a very deep chapter. Uh, we're going to have to split this up into, into two parts. So join us again next time as we will finish this chapter. But uh, I hope it was a blessing. Let's close in prayer. Jesus, we want to give you the highest praise. Hallelujah. God, you're worthy of it. All of us together, wherever we are at, spanning across miles, spanning across time, we lift up our voice to praise you. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. In Jesus' name, thank you for joining us. God bless.